Good morning, coaches. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, week's edition of Motivational Monday. I think you all know what the topic is. It's a really special topic about putting ability before disability. So as we welcome more people into uh, the room, the Zoom room, uh, I'd like you to just sit back and enjoy um, some videos that uh, is meant to just ref get the ask coaches to reflect on our thoughts about ability and our thoughts about disability. Yeah. So, but just before that, a reminder to all of you: if you could uh, mute your mic and turn on your videos. So, the muting of the mic obviously is uh, to make sure that we don't interrupt uh, the presenters and. Uh, by turning on the videos, we all like to see your nice uh, looking faces uh, this morning. Yeah. All right. The spark in our hearts when dreams are born. It's just the start, and we've come so far. It's time to soar And there's no fear that video because really 
that is a powerful message if you if you really reflect about how um, that video really shows um, you know that we are really the same in so many ways whether you are able or whether you are disabled yeah so those who have just joined us good morning uh, we're just showing a couple of videos here to just let everyone reflect on uh, particularly today's topic about putting ability before disability. Good morning, coaches. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, welcome everybody. To, welcome to Motivational Monday, 22nd of June. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, fathers in the room, in this Zoom room. And let me wish you happy Father's Day. Um, and I hope you had a wonderful time yesterday celebrating with your family, particularly with Phase 2. People can now go out. And I hope you have a nice meal with everyone or with your loved ones, certainly. Um, this week is really a special week for us because we are looking at the topic of inclusion and inclusivity and inclusiveness. 
And this morning, we have three really, really experienced speakers with us and really privileged to have Hanson Bay, Stephanie Ang, and uh, Sharifa with us. And I'll introduce them sh shortly. But uh, just to put in some ground rules before we begin, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, that was before uh, a whole bunch of you came into the room. So as you know, we want to have a really good interaction amongst the speakers. So if you could uh, turn off your mic until towards the end when we are going to be inviting questions. Uh, so turn off your mics, please, and turn on your video so we can see all your nice faces this morning. So um, as you know, the, the topic today is really about putting ability before disability. And I want to just play one more video before... Uh, we, we start, yeah, and I would like for you to just reflect as you're watching the video, reflect about uh, today's topic. Yeah? Yeah. I was just a little boy from a little town I made a wish that someday I could turn this around I may believe that I was right on top of the world And in my mind I saw the many valiant hearts They held me to their dreams and never once fell apart Like superhero Sam and Tom But you'll find your way around Someday you wake up feeling like you're on top of the world So coaches and uh, participants I don't know about you, but uh, that's certainly not the first time that I uh, watch that video. And every time I 
I watched that video. I must say, I I continue to feel inspired by uh, you know the abilities of uh, uh, those athletes. And I think the message there is really about you know go going beyond ordinary and therefore celebrating the extraordinary. And that really brings us to the topic for for today, Motivational Monday, putting ability before disability. Uh, as I said earlier, we are privileged to have uh, three really um, very experienced um, speakers in Stephanie Ang, Hanson Bay, and Sharifa. Uh, Steph is a colleague of ours in Sport SG, and she's been involved in disability sport for, for the longest time and has been involved in organizing para games and so many things. Really wonderful work, Steph. Steph, you just want to, would you like to say hi to everyone on Zoom? And Hi, good Facebook. morning, coaches and all. I see quite a lot of familiar faces and actually some of the volunteers here. It's kind of cool. Hi, Steph. Yeah. Welcome, Hi, welcome, everyone. Yeah. Hello, Stephanie. The next speaker Hello, we Hansel. have is, uh, um, yeah, another colleague of ours, Hanson. Hanson is uh, currently uh, part of our Coach SG staff, uh, but he has uh, experiences in uh, as a physical education uh, teacher. Uh, and also currently the goalball coach, our national team goalball uh, coach. Uh, Hanson, you want to say hi to everyone? Good morning, everybody. Those Good are morning. fathers in the room, happy Father's Day. <laughs> All right. And the third speaker for, for today is a good friend of mine. We've known each other for several years now, uh, Sharifa. Um, she is quite famous in the uh, special ed uh, uh, sector. Uh, many people will know her and also know that she has uh, two daughters who are doing really well, um, a former sailor as well as a bowler. Sharifa, you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, Hello. good morning, everyone. It's really, morning. it's really cool to meet all the cool coaches this morning. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sharifa. We're all cool on a cool Monday morning <laughs> and uh, we can't wait to, to, to start hearing from uh, you. But just to set the context here, and I want uh, coaches here, uh, because I, I see some familiar faces and I know some of you have been attending uh, our workshops. I really hope you found it useful. So this is going to be a test. Yeah, we're going to start with a bit of a test. So this was what we um, had last week where we invited uh, Benjamin Tan, Master Teacher and Pesta MOE. Can I have uh, you guys indicate uh, on the chat that you had joined us. If you had joined us uh, for this session, uh, put yes, please. So I can see uh, all the different chats. All right, some say yes, some say no. Okay, all right. So I see Lauren saying yes, Hamid Khan saying yes. So we're going to test you again, yeah? So if you recall, uh, Ben talked about the structure of uh, teaching and coaching and about Boston. And he showed this spectrum. So what was the style that Ben uh, shared that relates to today's topic? Who would like, uh, just put it on the chat. What was the style that Ben shared that relates to today's topic? What was the coaching style? What was the teaching style? Those who, who were with us last week, can you recall? Okay, I don't see many responses. Uh, so it looks like still a very early in the morning for everyone uh, to be tested this way. So if you recall, this was what uh, he shared in terms of the reproduction cluster. And this was the production cluster. So yeah, there are many styles and they talk about practice style. But one that relates to today's topic um, is really about inclusion, right? And if you recall, Ben talks about the slanting rope analogy. Now, the idea of inclusion is something that we should always be thinking about as coaches, as teachers, because in a typical class, and again, I'm going to ask you to, to put it in the chat, how many of you have experienced uh, challenges when, I mean, if you were to, if I were to ask you to time travel with me, right, back to when we were younger, uh, when we were in school, how many of you and you can say yes on the chat. How many of you had difficulties trying to keep up with the physical activity, trying to keep up with uh, the sports that we were trying at that uh, point in time when we were kids? Say yes if you face some kind of difficulty. 
All right, nicely done, nicely done. Yeah. And how many of you were born in the later part of the year, the last three months of the year? Put yes in the chat if uh, that's you. All right, and for those who were born in the later part of the year, how many of you experience uh, or have got experience where in the class, right, when you're in primary school, in secondary school, you're always the smallest guy in the class? Say yes uh, if uh, that's the case for you. All right, some interesting uh, uh, responses there, a lot of yes. So, uh, why, why am I asking you these questions? Is because you know, when we coach, when we teach, we don't have a homogeneous group. We have a mix of, uh, you know, high ability students and learners. We have a mix of, uh, we have some middle abilities and we have some uh, who are lower ability. So the challenge for us is how do we design our activities? How do we design our lessons such that we are inclusive so that the not so strong ones or the less skilled ones feel challenged? Um, and also those who are high ability equally feel challenged. So how do we optimize that challenge for them such that they find it meaningful, they find themselves uh, wanting to be engaged in the activity. So that's the bigger idea or the larger idea of being inclusive and the idea of inclusion as per Mostan theory. So, but I think in saying that, we also need to recognize that there are a lot more persons with disabilities or PWDs as we call them. Uh, in the mainstream schools and in our group. So those uh, individuals require a special kind of attention. And then that's where the sharing by staff uh, and Hanson and Sharifa, I think will be really meaningful and very useful for us teachers and coaches uh, today. Yeah. So this is what um, the Vision 2030 sort of uh, illustration looks like. And I want you to just look at the bottom there. Uh, the bottom red part that talks about sport without boundaries. And that's something that we really, really believe in. That's something that we really want to push for, that sport, sport must be without boundaries. We, we shouldn't be excluding people to take part in sport. And if you had watched the video just now, right, it's really inspiring how uh, the athletes overcome, you know, the obstacles and do really, really well and do Singapore proud. And this were the recommendations that came out uh, from it and some of you are familiar with it um, and this this topic or this particular tenet about sport without boundaries is something that we sometimes we forget that uh, good sport has room on the board for for everyone who wants to play regardless of age regardless of capabilities gender and social status and that's the really that's really the whole idea of sport without boundaries I'd like to share a story about Narin. And Narin um, is close to me because he is my, my nephew. So in 2015, he represented Singapore uh, in chess when we hosted the, the Sea Games and the Para Games. So he represented uh, Singapore in chess. He has cerebral palsy. He, he was born that way. And um, I brought my kids, uh, my two kids, uh, to, to, uh, to support him in 2015 and I think they, they were amazed at uh, not just his ability but we went around to look at table tennis and we saw Jason Chi in action, we saw badminton uh, players in action and it was really inspiring. Uh, they, they were certainly, my, 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 do, my, my kids I mean, were certainly inspired by uh, what uh, the capability of these people and uh, they walk away thinking that uh, everything is possible. Yeah, and two years later, uh, Narain won a silver medal um, in paracycling or other hand cycling. And I think we, we know who this person is. Uh, uh, last year, she spoke really, really inspiring speech in parliament and she made a rally to everyone and she made the call to action. Let's put ability before disability. Um, and just a short clip for you to see what, what what her experiences were. My first coaches would bring my siblings and I to the swimming complex. I would just play in the baby pool alone. I asked my first coaches if I could learn to swim properly. 
water. Water is the ticket to my freedom. So water is the ticket to my freedom. Right, so and she wouldn't be where she is today in terms of uh, all the achievements if not for someone, a coach who has, uh, you know, really exposed her to, to swimming. And of course, the parents, first coaches. So with this, I, I would like to, to invite Steph um, to now uh, take over and share her thoughts and, uh, you know, her experiences uh, in this area of inclusion. Steph? Thanks, Aza. I'll share screen. Yeah. Okay, good morning all. Thanks Aza and CoSG for inviting me to this uh, webinar. It's really a privilege and um, to see so many of you here. So I'm Stephanie here. I'm actually uh, from SportSG, uh, under Active SG Sport Care, uh, the Disability Sports Master Plan team. So can someone guess uh, what sport is this? Mm. Okay, you can shout out or you can put it on the, the oh, chat. Oh. Did someone say go ball? Okay, bocha, right, great. So, sorry, bocha, so B O C C I A. So, bocha is actually a game that's being played uh, by persons with very severe disability. It started off actually for persons with cerebral palsy, but has now actually opened up for more opportunities for those with severe motor development. So my first team, uh, so Bocha was the first team that I led uh, in two, 2009. Um, and, and that was where, you know, everything started uh, for me in, in my love for, you know, for helping and, and being in this area for serving for persons with disabilities. Um, so you can see actually at this very first game, uh, Nuru also cleaned her first silver. Uh, so in a team where for, for persons with disabilities, there's actually many different support that is needed. Uh, ranging from, you know, the caregivers, the parents, uh, volunteers as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a small team, uh, but again, it, it, you know, requires a lot of hard work from everyone. I'd like to share a little bit about what um, Aza mentioned earlier about sports without boundaries. And the Disability Sports Master Plan was actually born out of the, you know, the uh, sport without boundaries uh, effort in, in trying to promote sports for persons with disabilities. Uh, so like what uh, Azar shared, the ASEAN Horror Games was held in 2015 and, and that draw a lot of um, my feelings and, and, you know, because I was part of the organizing team at the point of time. And, and now it has translated to this um, master plan. Um, and that, you know, with the recommendations, uh, while we strive for, for inclusion, as well as for more people with disabilities to get involved in sports, um, you know, it, it cannot be done without um, the efforts of many of us here. So over here is a video uh, to show you a little bit about our journey that we have taken through so far. An event filled with grief, fueled by dedication, commitment, and passion. Held for the first time in Singapore, the 8th ASEAN Para Games is packed with motivating moments, encouraging our athletes to boldly pursue greatness. Our journey towards inclusive sport begins here. Expanding opportunities for sports participation. Since 2016, we have achieved launching our first center of expertise and with four more centers of expertise by 2021. Five inclusive gyms with trained fitness instructors with two more opening in 2020.
upgrades to older sports facilities for better accessibility. Five wheelchair accessible swimming pools. Disability sports programs rolled out to serve the needs of different disability groups and different levels of sports participation. Developing organizational and professional capabilities partnership with International Paralympic Committee to build the disability sports coaching base. Partnerships with industry expertise to train disability sports volunteers. Building awareness about disability sports. Over 20 outreach events in partnership with special education schools, social service organizations, hospitals, and homes. This is our journey towards sport without boundaries. So in a nutshell, these are the three trusts uh, with 18 recommendations. Um, so the end goal is to strive towards a disability ecosystem uh, that enable and empower more persons with disabilities to live better through sports. So this cannot be done without the support from active partnership with you know, the three Ps. Uh, definitely, of course, coaches like you. So I'd like to give you an overview about the prevalence rates of um, PWDs in Singapore. I think it's important for you to know in, in terms of the spectrum of this um, problem. And here, according to MSF, um, there's actually an estimated of 3%, but actually it's an underestimation uh, of the Singapore um, entire population. So with an increasing aging population, more people uh, are actually getting older and they actually have some form of disabilities uh, either due to illness and that maybe some of them are also due to accidents, um, you know, that happens, right? So next, uh, this is actually my uh, research that I'm doing currently uh, for, for my practicum. It's actually a, a, a snapshot of what I find that may be useful for you to understand. Uh, but I'd like to highlight that, you know, some of them think that, you know, for persons with uh, physical disabilities that, you know, their disability can be a health constraint to them. And often they may need a caregiver. And, you know, sports equipments are like their hands and legs, you know, for, like for all of us. Uh, because we, we need uh, those kind of equipments to help them and support them to participate in sports. Um, so PWDs often face uh, societal barriers and disability evokes uh, negative perceptions and discrimination in many societies. Uh, sports can really help to reduce all this stigma and discrimination associated with their disability uh, because it can transform community attitudes about PWDs by highlighting their skills and reducing the tendency to see their disability yeah, to see their disability instead of their instead of the person. So that's why we are all striving towards uh, inclusive sports. Uh, disability sports in a way uh, in, can help to, to bridge this community gap. And we have seen it through actually a lot of the work that we have been doing where we bridge, um, you know, persons with disabilities when we are having programs, we have volunteers who come on board to, to partner them as well. So sports uh, really changed the persons with disabilities in an equally profound way by empowering persons with disabilities to realize their full potential and advocate for changes in society. So the unique ability of sports to transcend uh, linguistic, cultural and social barriers makes it an excellent platform for strategies of inclusion and adaptations. Furthermore, the universal uh, popularity of sport and its physical, social and economic development benefits make it an ideal tool for fostering the inclusion and well-being of persons with disabilities. So your role is so important uh, to give them the opportunities to start. 
fun and socializing is something that they enjoy most, but always check with the individual and understand their motivations behind why they do sports. So here is an ecosystem uh, for PWDs. Uh, why is it important for coach to know? Like I mentioned in my earlier part of my presentation, when I started my journey, uh, it is important to work with the person with disabilities and as well as those who are around them, their social environment, um, because that's where they can actually be empowered to live within and participate actively in their community. The influencers like their families, um, the people around them, like the health professionals, uh, coaches like you, uh, that's where you have a big impact to where they would be in, in, in the future. So next is actually a, a story of a Think Singapore athlete Aisha, who also participated um, in the ASEAN Power Games. Um, so that's, I'll leave the video and let you all watch it. First few times I was very angry. I'm, I'm embarrassed because they were looking at you as you are, as if you're alien. You know, like I was like, I owe you money, is it? Aisha Samai, age 48, I guess this year. I'm a housewife, I'm a mother of two at home. I'm a government, I order people to do stuff for me. I'm a para-athlete, but I rest for a while, still deciding to continue. I've not been shooting for about a year plus after my last Asian game in Jakarta. say is a streptococcus is a flesh eating bacteria because of that the organs all fail and then they have to put me blood transfusions and kidney dialysis from an active person i became like bedridden for like three months because but i i, I didn't know because i was sedated but during my sedation period we woke up and then slept again woke up and slept again but there was one time my sister was saying that the doctor needs to cut your hands and legs so at that very particular moment you know because you were very ill so i thought it was just my my fingers and my toes i did not i did not know that when i woke up at that period it was the whole four limbs uh, gangrene kicks in gangrene is where all your limbs your end limbs uh, turn black you know cops where they don't have blood flowing and it, it got rotten so the doctor have to amputate all the four limbs to save my life Um, discharged from ICU to the normal ward and then my sister went back so my son is late and then I felt very thirsty and the tube was all out so I was quite emotional and then because there's nobody around so I was like thought of uh, attempted suicide so I say like if uh, I cannot even drink water so how I kill myself how to jump down the building like, or how to drink poison who don't feed me poison few times I was very angry. I'm, I'm embarrassed because they were looking at you as you are as if you're alien. You know, like I was like, I owe you money, is it? After a while, I I tend to accept things. Like the auntie right was on bicycle. So I was downstairs, I was in a wheelchair because I haven't put on my aesthetic legs. We haven't made one. So this auntie suddenly stopped the motor, motor, uh, bicycle. No? And then look at me, like and say, auntie, chi market auntie, ah, mama cho. Like, I can accept it. Like, uh, if you cannot be there, you join them. Lah. I mean, sometimes it might be you, you know, like, like you were so sure, like, how come this person become like this? So I cannot blame others. I was a single mother in year 2000. I was a strict mom. I really control my children. I told them that studies, I will sponsor. But whatever things you want, extra, 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 you work for yourself. When I got sick, I don't have to worry about them. They look after me. They send me into the toilet. And some teenagers, they don't need it, especially boys. After my pooing or uh, peeing, they will do everything for me. I told my team that I wanted to be a shooter again. I started training, so I have a coach 
who is very, very supportive and very, very understanding. She supported me all the way because when I was an able body, she was a shooter herself. Actually, the, the, the journey is not that tough, but the supports are different. When I was an able body, I only go for Asian games like uh, SEA Games. But when I was a pro athlete, I went for World Cup. So I went to Germany, I went to Croatia, I went to Korea. I've been training hard because it's not an easy position to be in your condition to shoot. But I have to move the whole hand. Plus, I have a short stump. So when I move my stump, my, my whole shoulder will also move. And plus, whatever happens, uh, there's, always, there's always a reason behind it. And be it better or be it for worse, right? There's always a silver lining. But to me, I am still alive. I can witness my son got married. I married after amputated. I mean, I'm a single parent for 16 years, and I met my husband after my condition. So why is it so pity? I mean, I am very grateful. I'll leave you with a quote. Um, when you focus on someone's uh, disabilities, you will overlook their abilities, beauty, and uniqueness. And recently, I actually met uh, an overseas partner, potential partner, and he, this is what he shared and it, it, in, in me. PWs are actually problem solvers, uh, constantly adapting what they get around to solve the problem. And the channel that we, they get a better life beyond sports, uh, that's where coaches, we actually have to believe in them and how to navigate them to sports, housing and employment. You know, in fact, there's many of those uh, persons with disabilities, uh, athletes themselves, actually strives and, and that they get uh, really good employment as well. So how do we get them, you know, to, to realize their, their best potential? All right, so here's some of the uh, causes that we are running at the RP. Uh, so do check that out uh, if you'd like to, to learn more and share more. Uh, that's where you know the community of coaches can come together and learn from one another. Uh, leaving you with my favorite um, Michael, Michael Jordan's um, in terms of the, the quote. A coach is someone that uh, sees beyond your limits and guide you to your greatness. With that, I have a handover to Sharifa who will share more with her experiences working with the community and coaches. So join us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Thank you very much. Uh... A really moving story in uh, in Aisha and uh, a nice, really nice quote by Michael Jordan there. Um, Sharifa, we let me see. All right, Hi, Sha, over to you. Yes. Hi everyone. Good morning. So who? So today, uh, I'm really glad to be here to be sharing with I said the cool coaches, right? So I thought uh, this morning. Um, I get the opportunity to share some stories with regards to my favorite words, which is which are connection, relationship, as well as possibilities. So let me share David's story. So where's David? Asa, can I see David, please? Yes, that's David. Okay, right. So uh, let me describe David. So David is a committed team player of a dragon boat team. And the team is called Different Dragons. Yes, it's called Different Dragons. And believe me or not, it's a competitive dragon boat team. Competitive, that means they do races, okay? Don't play play. So uh, you may be asking me, right? Dragon boat, competitive, dragon boat, racing. But what, what is David doing here in this picture? So what you're seeing is, um, what you see? So David is actually drenching himself. He's splashing water on his head. And, and every Saturday when he goes, before he even start training, this is what exactly he does. So some of you might say that this is like, it looks awkward, but importantly, um, it's, it's what makes David comfortable. So David has autism. He does have anxiety when he's in different environment. 
um, he does have difficulties in communication or communicating his emotions, in, uh, communicating his thoughts. But um, importantly, given the opportunity, David can enjoy sports. Right, so, so for David to be able to enjoy sports and having that opportunity, importantly, who do we have? Of course, supportive family members and Guess who was the brave dragon in David's sporting life? Aza, who is that? Right? So then you see the pedals, you see the, because importantly, you also look at the, the life jacket, right? So very important. Right. Next. Yeah, so you see this word impossible. Do you see the word impossible or do you see the word possible? So for David, for David's family and David's friends and me, David's teacher, we see the word possible. So what do we mean by possible? Because we have a brave dragon. Next. Next slide, uh, Aza. So, uh, so these are some of the pictures that um, that I want to share with regards to what happens on every, every Saturday morning. So every picture tells a story. So the brave dragon here is Coach Ryan. So you see the first picture is Coach Ryan being so serious, right, with David. And I couldn't get the angle, but David is smiling because there's possibilities created by people like Coach Ryan. So when I say possibilities, it's possibilities for David to be out at, on the boat in the water. So the initial thoughts, right? I think when David's dad first shared uh, with my principal and us um, talking about Dragon Boat, and then we say, oh, he's going to be out in the sea. He's going to be out in the water. So what if he jumps down? And we have so much worries, right? But uh, what we didn't know was there's such a brave dragon. It's not only David being the brave dragon, but actually it's Coach Ryan. Next. So that's David. Um, getting used to the new environment and what's really cool about the picture that the picture that you see David in blue are his friends so he not only has a Saturday morning learning the skill of, of dragon boating but his ecosystem has also expanded looking at the people around him the people with with um, uh, special needs the people without special needs and the people with a big heart who wants to bring David included in the main, uh, main community. So what exactly is inclusion? You know, this is like a big agenda. The government is talking about it. People are talking about it. So what uh, Mr. Go, Matthew's dad, one of my uh, students' dad, uh, he, he was very, very serious when he says, people with special needs do not need sympathy. What they need is opportunities. So. Um, Exactly, these are very profound quotes because it's real quotes by fathers of people uh, who, who, who are different with regards to their challenges, their learning needs. So coaches, remember, it's not like you take the kids in because you sympathize with them, like poor thing, la, you, know, uh, you know, they got nowhere to go. So it's not like that. As a teacher, I want to encourage you to create opportunities because inclusion is about creating opportunities so that there will be more possibilities for our kids and our young adults with special needs. So often when um, we hear, right, um, parents approaching coaches and say, um, can, can you help? Uh, can, I, can my son be part of your, uh, uh, your training session on Saturday or on, on, on Friday and so on? And then uh, oftentimes what we hear or parents report to us, to say that the coaches say, not me, I'm not ready. Why don't you see coach B? And then when they, they approach coach B and coach B say, um, I'm not ready. Can you approach coach C? So often this becomes the cycle of challenges faced by parents. So like what Stephanie mentioned just now, I think in her research, interestingly, um, the research actually tells you the same story I have. Uh, with regards to understanding barriers. So I don't think the quotas who say, not me, not ready, they're not bad people, you know, I'm not judging, 
because I'm a mindful uh, special ed practitioner. So it's really about attitudinal um, barriers. So what exactly this means is like when people have incorrect understanding and mindsets about disability. So it's uh, probably lack of information. Um, and because of lack of information and understanding of what exactly or who exactly these people are, with special needs, that's why different words appear like fear, ooh, stress, anxiety. I'm, I'm very anxious because this kid is so different, right? And more often than not, it's like very leche. Leche, very complicated. Like I have to do this, do a lot of extra things. Um, and then a lot of coaches, I think some of the main things that, that, uh, that are barriers is actually the safety issues. We totally understand because that's really important about to make sure that uh, everything is safe, your training session. So often it's also lack of knowledge. Uh, you, you don't know so much about autism. You don't know how to manage the wheelchairs. So the words that comes out is, I don't know. Right? And what are the other words? What should I do? Or what should I do first? How do I plan? Or what if? So here, Motivational Monday, I want to ask you, why not you? So as a special ed practitioner, I mentioned, so I want to challenge you. Why not you? Forget about these barriers, right? Because more understanding equals to more possibilities. So uh, here I'm going to share with you uh, some of the coaches, as I mentioned, the cool coaches that I've met in my journey in, in special education. And who are they? So we have a coach here who, who uh, have been working with kids with autism. So she's Coach Maria. And when I say autism straight away, some of you would know that with autism, there are challenges in visual processing, the sensory challenges, like what I mentioned about David, uh, communication, they don't quite understand the concept of time, there's intense interest in certain prefer preferences and specific routines and uh, feeling discomfort in various settings. But here's Coach Maria, so I hope Coach, getting to know Coach Maria will, will inspire you uh, this um, Monday morning. So let's see who are, so Coach Marie actually works with a few boys. So as she said, I st she started training these boys in 2017, and then they were only able to run 200 meters nonstop. But they end up being able to walk 10 kilometers. So this is Maria with Vince, Chia Xiang, and Chia Wei. And guess where this photo is taken? So actually, they were in Mount Fuji. So they went through an outdoor education program with Coach Maria and team. So from hiking in Mekwichi to Bukitima, and in 2019, they all shock us because they were fit and prepared to attend Mount Fuji. Don't play play, it's really Mount Fuji in Japan. So cool, right, Coach Maria? So what, what has made this happen? So uh, like Coach Maria, I would like to uh, encourage you to bring your own toolbox, I think. With regards to the toolbox, uh, what's really important is, uh, I think what I can say is that like the teacher, the coach is like a craftsman. Every art piece is different and you have a toolbox. So, so you will pick out tools. So you build the tools and you pick out the tools that you need for different phases in your coaching journey. So you might use the screwdriver, you might use the hammer, so what we mean now is what you've been going through the various courses with Steph, with Azha, and with Hanson. So what's required is actually once you have the toolbox, is, so you use strategies like adapted sports strategies, autism-friendly strategies. When I say autism-friendly strategies that you've learned include probably structure. Why structure? To, to help provide meaning and organization in the environment. So you would have like extra tapes you put, on your track, some markers, so that they know exactly where to stand, for example. So visuals are very important because they provide clarity. So we're also talking about routines to provide predictability. So we have certain schedules. So if you're not sure, the parents will be there to be able to probably give you some tips on how to manage uh, or, or make things clearer for the kids. So number three is explore different modes of communication. So 
Um, if verbal is not the verbal is not the only mode of communication, the sign language, using visual, so so explore, okay? Coaches, my challenge to you is explore. So this is another coach, very inspiring coach that has uh, inspired many lives uh, because of her, her same thinking about ability before disability. So Sue, Coach Sue, has, uh, is very special in the hearts of many young adults with Down syndrome, with IDs, with ASD, like Raman. Look at, look at Raman, the smiles in his, on his face. So Raman has cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy means there's a defect in the part of the brain that makes, it challenge, makes him having some challenges with mobility. However, um, you know, because Sue wanted uh, he to wanted to give him the opportunity to explore sports, so that's Boshe. So look at the next photo. You see Raman actually being competitive in the Boshe competition. So what she did, what coach did was actually to adapt the game by introducing the slide whereby instead of having Raman to actually uh, use his, uh, you know, uh, to slide the ball down instead of to, to throw the ball. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, we have many other stories of uh, coaches. So the point is to understand, like uh, uh, the picture that you're going to see here. Can you imagine sailing for kids with cerebral palsy or young adults with cerebral palsy? So here we see Yuki. Yuki is an uh, ex-sailor. That's my daughter, actually, Yuki. So she's explored uh, working with uh, kids with cerebral palsy and kids with different needs. And, and really, so um, uh, when I asked her about her experience, she was really happy because it's about more than just uh, teaching the skill of knowing how to sail. Uh, what she says was that that's, that's about building the self-esteem, building the confidence in uh, people with special needs. Uh, next, Anta. Yeah. So, so to be able to sail not only brings joy, yeah, so it's really about bring, uh, bringing joy. So that's Yuki and a few more uh, coaches that I want to show you. So what you see here are smiles. So smiles because we have a, a special coach called Coach Francis. So Coach Francis, this is a beautiful photo of Coach Francis and the deaf team. So they actually represent Singapore in various places, even as far as Turkey, whereby one of the bowlers actually won gold in, in the competition. So his, his thoughts about this, about special education or special needs children is, uh, or adults is the aspiration and the courage to providing learning opportunities, building capabilities, as well as changing attitudes about what they can do and can enjoy. So coaches, come on, let's change attitudes, okay? So um, I was, I, I'm very inspired by what I learned when I went for a conference in Scotland uh, two years ago. Their tagline is, until everyone understands. So until everyone understands, that's where Steph, myself, Azha are going to be or continue to be your buddies because what's important is that let's bring people with different needs included in the community. Let's build them uh, the capability so that they'll be empowered. And like us, we want them to thrive in the community. So my last slide, coaches. So this are, look at the smiles of the faces of our athletes. They may be young, but they've got a big heart. And are you ready to be the champion? So uh, this is my last slide. And uh, I really uh, thank you for uh, giving me your attention because really it's about, are you ready to be the champion? Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharifa. Thanks for that wonderful sharing. So a call to action there, are you ready to be that champion, right? And I think uh, I also like particularly the, the last quote about until everyone understands. And I think that's the purpose of uh, today's session is really to get um, you coaches out there and many more on live on Facebook to, to really understand uh, what this special group is like and how the, we, can we provide opportunities for them. And that brings us uh, to some of the strategies that we, we need to be aware of and brings us to Hanson. Morning once again, everybody. Yes, I'll be exploring some of the strategies that we can apply in order for us to be inclusive coaches. But before I go into that, I was just walking through the chat group and um, I actually picked out the most popular word for this morning. And it's actually inspiring. 
inspiration. At the same time, uh, Azar shared about how his kids were inspired by his nephew as well. Now, um, there are always two sides to the coin. And although we want to be inspired, we do not necessarily want to be carried away by inspiration. Now, why am I saying this? If you um, are aware, the least favorite word by Paralympians is inspiration. And here are some reasons why. Number one, inspiration often is uh, laced with pity. Now, if you coach an athlete and if you are clouded by pity, inevitably, you are focusing on what they cannot do rather than what they can do. So the word here is empathy rather than inspiration. And a lot of times, para athletes or athletes, right, they do not necessarily want to want an identity that would that, um, that it is their job to inspire others. I'll share an example with you in uh, Colombia where I went for a uh, para conference. So this uh, very well-known seated volleyball athlete was being interviewed by a group of students and they keep telling him how inspiring he is. I think he got a little bit annoyed at some point in time. He told the students, I lost my limbs in the wall. I'm not here to inspire anybody. I need a way to make a living. I need a way to support my family, and which is why I'm so committed to being the best that I can be, to feed my family, not necessarily inspire, inspire you guys. And um, last but not least, um, it gives wrongly the impression that every person with impairment or every PWD right, has this ability to perform like our APG athletes, to be able to perform like Paralympians. Now that's not true. Regardless of whether you are able-bodied or if you are a person with impairment, we all come from different backgrounds. There is such a thing as privilege also, even among PWDs. There are persons with disabilities due to shame among their family members. They are ashamed of their kids and they lock them up at home. So these guys, they may not necessarily have the ability to perform at the level of Paralympians and to inspire everybody. Now I'd like to reiterate, there's nothing wrong with uh, inspiring, but there are two sides to the coin and uh, let's not be carried away with it. Yeah. All right, um, I'm going to go into my um, so-called uh, my lesson proper. I don't think this is a lesson, it's more of a sharing. Now, um, in 2019, the Compulsory Education Act has been extended to persons with impairments also. Now, this is significant because what this means is that all kids with impairments, like able-bodied persons, have to go to school. This is compulsory, meaning if you don't go to school, if you choose to lock up your kids because no, they are intellectually impaired, they have ASD, they are blind or what have you, okay, it's against the law. This is how impactful this is. Let me, re, um, let me share a story to um, impress upon everybody why this is impactful. A friend of mine who works with a volunteer welfare organization, this was only early last year. Okay. Um, an elderly couple sought help from them because um, they are old and they have a daughter who is in her 30s. She's partially blind and um, they found her later also intellectually impaired. So she's been locked up at home for 30 over years. Now by the time she got to come up from home, okay, she was so overweight, she really stank. Okay, her hair was in a mess and this is just not right. And why does her parent, you know, have her at home? Because I'm making a judgment which may or may not be right. It could be due to shame. So with such a legislation in place, 
these parents, if they don't allow their kids to go to school, it's going to be against the law. And I hear coaches saying things like, this is a coming from a Wushu coach. Maybe I shouldn't use, uh, maybe I shouldn't have um, named the sport. Okay, because uh, he was sharing with us that, you know, um, these kids with ASD nowadays, they are in the mainstream schools also. You know, I'm not ready to coach them. You know what, Hansel, I need to learn how to lock their hands and legs, you know. Do you think that other coaches will be able to do that? So we shouldn't be allowing them to be in our CCA classes. Now, after 2019, more and more of these uh, students who are more higher functioning are going to be slowly, slowly getting into the mainstream schools. And as a coach, you cannot say that you don't want to coach them anymore. So this legislation has that sort of impact socially. And uh, I will discuss a little bit more, or rather my main objective today is to discuss how this is going to impact you as a coach. Okay, what you need to be prepared of as more and more higher functioning persons with impairment come into the mainstream schools. Uh, next slide, please, Azar. Now, let's make use of a scenario to get you guys thinking about this. If you are a coach, you just took over a team and there's a athlete who has got a mouse cerebral palsy. Now, this is what you've noticed. He's either practicing on his own or when he's playing, he hardly gets any touches of the ball. So, as an inclusive coach with the right mindset, what will you do? Now, at this point in time, I would like you guys to key in your answers in the chat group. I'm sure you guys, being experienced coaches, we have some strategies that you can make use of to make this lesson more inclusive. Please go on, key in some suggestions. There's no such thing. There is such a thing as a wrong answer, but it's good. When we have wrong answers, that's when we learn. Come on, coaches, just hammer in what you, what you think. Very good, Sandy. Mingle him with some able players and get them to train together with him. Nice. Ah, Michael, well done. Every two passes must pass to him. That's the rule. Very good, you change the rules. Let him take the free kicks, more time on the ball, more opportunities. Find creative ways to have him touch the ball. Awesome. Partner him with someone who cares and is non-judgmental. Very good. Coaches, you see, based on your, re on your response, right? You know, one of the main barriers uh, by coaches, or rather that's what they claim, they say they're not ready. But judging from your responses, I reckon all of you are inclusive coaches already. Whether you realize it or not, to a large extent, that you guys are inclusive coaches. You may not necessarily have worked with PWDs, but inclusion means giving athletes or players or students with different abilities in your class, in your session, a chance to participate. And it doesn't mean that they have a disability. Even those able-bodied kids among themselves, there are those who are better skilled and those who are less skilled. So how do I involve everybody? You are really an inclusive coach if you are thinking along those lines. So here's a very simple uh, method that I'll be sharing with you guys on how you can be a more inclusive coach. So some of you have already mentioned, you know, pair the player, the cerebral palsy football player with um, another student who could be helping him. Now that is a change already in your coaching style, in your teaching style. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some suggestions on how you can uh, change your teaching style. And what you mentioned earlier was to try a body system. So you can get the body to be on the sidelines or anybody who is not playing at a, at a point in time to give instructions to the less skilled or even the less, or rather 
I would say you do the same for less skilled athlete. So you can do the same for an athlete with cerebral palsy also. With regards to teaching and coaching style, uh, back to the previous slide first. So uh, this is especially important when uh, we are working with uh, athletes with sensory impairments, hearing and uh, visual. So if you observe my coaching, if I'm coaching global, I use different styles just uh, when I'm explaining to my athletes. So one of the first thing I'll get them to do is to, guys, stand in a position where you can see me. So visual impairment, there's a spectrum. Some of them can see more, some of them can see from the side, some of them can see from the center. So it's kind of weird, but uh, you see people who are positioning themselves shoulder to, towards me, but they're actually the ones who can see from the side. So that's the first thing I do. And, um, there are some who can not see at all, total blackness. So I will get some to hold the touch and then position perhaps and get he or her to touch their body so that they know where's the start and end position. And I do have a girl who is, um, she has a phobia of uh, men, males. So I need to get a female coach to touch her also. So this is how you vary your coaching style. Next slide, please. Rules and regulations. I think uh, some one of the coaches, I think it was, uh, oh, I can't recall her name all of a sudden. Okay, you mentioned about how you can change the rules to allow you know, a certain number of passes before you can score. And we can allow him to take all the free kicks also. So this is how you change your rules and regulations to be more inclusive. See coaches, you are really inclusive coaches. Right, next slide, please. Environment. Now, uh, you can play zona in football. Okay, zona meaning that um, the ball must be played in every zone leading up or before you score. So that gives everyone, not only the kid with cerebral palsy, but everybody with a chance to touch the ball and be more involved. And the whole lesson becomes more inclusive. Next slide, please. Yep, equipment. So you want to, uh, maybe I will use GoBall as an example. The ball itself is heavy. Now, it's coming at you at, you know, at the Paralympics where it comes at you a 1.5 kg. Imagine the medicine ball coming at you at 80 km per hour. So we usually don't use that ball when we work with beginners. We use a foam ball instead. Okay, the size is smaller, the weight is lighter, and we play in a smaller court. That's where we change the environment. So this is how you modify equipment. And I'm sure that applies to different sports as well. Tennis, football, rugby. Nowadays it's increasingly accessible. Different equipment that is um, catered to different abilities. Okay, with that, uh, let's go on. Right. Okay. Um, Actually, there's no more next slide. Uh, that's my piece for now, but I would just like to end with um, a quick summary or rather guidelines. Now, coaches, if you have pen and paper, I would like you to write this down. There are three main guidelines what that you want to take note of when you're working with not only persons with PW, uh, or rather PWDs, but for any athlete in order to be more inclusive. Number one, don't be paise. The coach doesn't have to know everything. If you don't know, ask. Ask, can you do this? You know, can you, or can you do that? If not, what can I do to help you? I am helping you this way. Is this what you want? Is that comfortable for you? Ask. Okay. Number two, focus on abilities, not disabilities. PT is not going to help you focus on their ability. Think about what they can do and take baby steps. Now, these three guidelines are related. And the last one is to set challenges, not limits. I'll end off with um, a quick story about one of my players. Now, um, this particular player, he's, uh, he lost both his... Uh, vision in both eyes, I think um, in his late teens. 
So what happened was in secondary school, he got hit by a football in the face. So that caused a lot of uh, nerve damage. As he got older, eventually he couldn't see at all. And his dream when he was a kid was to be a national football player. So when I was coaching him, getting him ready for the Para Games in 2015, you know, go ball, right? You need to be hit by the ball, you know? So when the ball was approaching him and he needed to block, he was always uh, curling up like a prawn, you know? He was so afraid of the ball. So I tried different ways and um, it still didn't work. So eventually, I should have done this earlier, but I asked him, hey, what is really the problem? And uh, he broke down. So, and he told me that, you know, don't laugh at me, but I'm afraid of being blind. So this guy is already blind. And he tells me I'm, being, I'm afraid of being hit by the ball. I'm afraid of being blind. How did I feel? I really pitied him. And I wanted to say, you know, let's not do this. I'm not going to push you. But it was only when I shifted from pity to what can I do? Okay, what are the challenges that I can give him? You know, in Japan, Japanese, they have this saying, uh, this idea of Kaizen. What are the baby steps that I can make use of to help him overcome that fear? So I threw lighter balls, you know, then stronger balls, then I mix it up uh, lighter and stronger. And today, right, you will not believe that he is playing so well, no matter how hard a ball you throw against him. You know, even against the ties, they are world class. He's not afraid to block the boss. So keep these three guidelines in mind because it will truly make a difference. And keep in mind about inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Hanson. Uh, thank you, Steph, once again, and Sha. Uh, we do have some time left, uh, about 10 minutes or so for, for questions. So if you do have a question, you can unmute your mic and ask uh, the speakers directly. Mm -hmm. Or you can uh, type it on the chat and then uh, we can uh, bring up the questions uh, to, to the speakers today. Yep, you can ask your questions here if you do have uh, those to share with us or to, to ask the speakers. Can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Can you introduce yourself, please, first? Okay, uh, my name is Lawrence, and uh, I'm a swim coach. Uh, I've been teaching some special needs children uh, to swim freestyle. Okay, uh, their body movement, how do I improve their body movement in terms of the freestyle? Uh, I've been teaching children, this 17-year-old this, uh, uh, youth. So, probably he can float but his style is not as uh, good although i'm quite patient but what is your advice on teaching a uh, special needs to do it properly thanks lauren for the question um speakers perhaps uh, steph would you like to take on this question okay hi lauren i think first you can understand maybe the uh, the, the child that you are speaking is uh, Lawrence, you there? Can you hear me? Stephanie, I think you can answer it again. Uh, participants, please mute your mics. So, thank you. Yeah, Steph, can you answer it again? Thank you. Okay, so I think first of all, you've got to understand the body structure of the, of the child. Uh, and, and of course, depending on which is the, you know, the, the, you, you got to break down the, the activities to a smaller bite size so that, you know, the child can also improve or whichever, I mean, not, not, not specifically only the child, but, you know, any kind of disability or any person uh, so that, you know, you can actually improve as, as they go. So breaking the activity, like if you say uh, uh, a freestyle, so how would the freestyle, um, the final achievement of that will look like? 
but to also help the child understand, um, you know, maybe having to first get the child or, you know, the person with disability first understand whether he or she actually uh, gets what your instruction is uh, and then get the person to also perform in the way that you want, maybe in a demo, demo way, so that that will also allow the, the, the person to visualize how that looks like in, 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 in a in a way that uh, you want the child to perform. Thanks, Steph. Uh, Lawrence, I hope you, you, you heard uh, that response, uh, understanding the child and exactly what uh, the child can do, uh, what they cannot do, uh, and also to, to see if they can actually mm. or whether they have understood what you are sharing with them. And, and, and that, I suppose, relates to Hanson's point about you know, adopting different uh, teaching or coaching styles so that uh, they truly understand what is it that you are trying to share with them. So you can do demonstration, you can use uh, props uh, to demonstrate that. Uh, Hanson, you got uh, any inputs to, to add further to that question? I'm glad that um, Lawrence is asking us and uh, as a coach, right, you don't just want to ask your athletes, you know, uh, where you don't, where you are not sure, you also want to ask other persons, uh, for example, um, I have got athletes. Lawrence, I don't have an answer for you. I'm just sharing um, um, a strategy on how you can come to, or rather how you can find out what, or rather how you can find out an answer to your question. So I have athletes, right, because of their visual impairment from young, right, they have very little movements. So they can't even walk backwards without, you know, risking falling down. So I don't know how to help them to a certain extent. Although I'm PE trained, now this, some of these cases are a little bit uh, beyond my realm of knowledge. So what do I do? I actually ask the experts. So I ask persons like, I think one of my friends is uh, Janice. She's a lecturer at RP. She actually came down and uh, helped me work with some of the athletes that I have. So ask and find out. Um, thanks, Hanson, for that. I, I know uh, YJ and Chikin are keen to share on this. Uh, uh, I'll invite you to, to just uh, turn on your mic so you can share. YJ? Yeah, hi. Yes, we yeah, YJ, uh, we can hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Okay, I, I think for, for the, uh, uh, just on the, uh, the code, Jim, Team coach Lawrence, right? Yeah, Lawrence is. Yeah, you question. mentioned about the person. I think uh, the the uh, what I would do is that uh, to understand what uh, is his ability, what he's comfortable with. Then secondly, assess uh, whether is it a movement issue or is it a coordination issue, right? And uh, maybe when we do it, uh, I I would I would do it uh, on the dry land rather in the, than in the water. Because sometimes even an able-bodied person, a beginner, a novice learner, when you put him in the water, they feel panic, you see. So you get to understand this. Is it a, a movement issue or a coordination issue? Or is it a confidence issue? If you assess on the land, he's all right. You know, then you put him in the water, then he's unable to coordinate. Then it could be a, more of a water confidence issue. Then we address it. Uh, uh, when I was in Brunei, uh, I, I deal with uh, uh, people with different ability, right? But of course, these are able-bodied people. But what we do first with my Sri Lankan coach is that uh, we first of all give people the water confidence, you know, and we do a very unconventional way of doing it. And we get people to float first rather than start to swim, you know. So you float, uh, you know, with your with your back, uh, with your face uh, facing up. Then once a person gets the ability, uh, actually anybody can swim. You know very very quickly so we did a study with that uh, method so yeah i mean basically you have to assess uh, what is the the problem involved uh, yeah yeah thanks yj it's, it's really us uh, trying to find out a lot more about the athletes to see what is possible and uh, you know what are the things that they can do um chicken you have uh, something additional to share uh yeah because i'm a expert Palantian. Can you hear me? Yep, chicken, thanks. Excellent, Ian. But during my competition time or during my training, my coaches need to, I need to do a, a lot of repetition before I, I really can master 
master the precise stroke because my I'm a CP swimmer. So we need actually we need a lot of time to do the repetition before we can actually in our mind we know how, how to how to do the stroke, but to the for the body to learn to do the stroke correctly, we need to spend a lot of time to um master the, the whole stroke. That's all. Yeah, thank you, Chikin. Yeah. I know we are approaching uh, eleven thirty, so and I, I know some coaches may have uh, something to attend to. So I invite uh, you to stay on if you have further questions. But for the benefit of those who have uh, to leave us, um, I'm just gonna flash.